All right, y'all. I'm back again with another video. And a lot of stuff has come out in recent days, right? Like, so by now, if you have not heard, the league decided to cancel the Bulls' two games this week. And that's upon them hitting like 10 guys or so, basically being in protocol, you know, to include over the weekend, Zach Levine, Troy Brown Jr., and as of yesterday, Alizé Johnson, okay? And so the hope, I guess, is by the end, maybe you would get DeMar DeRozan back, you'll get Javante Green, Kobe White, and Derrick Jones. <clears throat> To couple with what you already have in Lonzo Ball, Alfonso McKinney, and Vucevic, and a couple other guys on the roster that don't have it yet, um, which is great. You know, we prefer to be at full strength and whatnot, but cool. Uh, Zach Levine won't be ready by the end because of how late um, he got in the COVID protocols, along with some of the others on the team. So, the next game that we'll be playing is against the Lakers, I believe, on the 19th. I think that's the uh, earliest game we will be allowed to play, which makes sense. You know, you got the surging Bulls. Well, let me not say surging because we lost the last two games. But you got the high Bulls for this year because uh, we damn sure wouldn't win it this time last year. You got the Lakers who are starting to, you know, build some ground uh, with LeBron back. And LeBron missed the first matchup on the uh, West Coast trip. So, here it is. This is the only other time that they play the Lakers this year, so they better, you know, make it count. And so the league don't want to miss that, especially since they already dropped the bag when they didn't include Chicago in Christmas Day games. So, that being said, this is good. They, they needed to do this. But the other thing, too, that I want to, you know, give people is, granted, this is only uh, 27 games into the season. We get a break. Call this a tax write-off in the NBA. We get a break. We get an opportunity for our guys to rest their legs and, and gain some traction off of that wear and tear. That normally never happens, right? Normally never happens. So guys get to get some some breaks that wouldn't normally occur, especially when you had guys that were playing like enormous minutes in recent games due to all the COVID protocol shit. So guys get to rest their ailing bodies. They get to recuperate. This couldn't have happened at a better time. Now I'm gonna be real. If they were gonna cancel games and shit, I wish I wish the order would have been different. I wish the Rosen would not have gotten it till late. Because, I mean, granted, you don't want anybody to get this virus, but hear me out. The order in which they got it, I think, would have benefited DeRozan a little bit better. Like, if DeRozan would have been the last guy that got it, because he's older, you know, that extra rest for his body will go a long way, like it did for LeBron when they had to sit out for those months before, uh, you know, the bubble. Which is part of the reason I think they even won the bubble anyway was because of that break that they had. I think it, it helped them out, especially LeBron who played all those minutes to get like a damn near five month, you know, break before you got to come back and try to compete. It, it, it gives your your body time to recover and rest. It's like an off season in the middle of the season. I'm not saying this is an off season in the middle of the season, but this is definitely an opportunity for guys like Caruso who had been nursing an injury to kind of get ready, get healthy, and get these guys some breaks. So I like this for this week. I really do. That's just from the team perspective. So the guys should come back, you know, ready and raring to go. It should be fully healthy, and we should be able to give everybody our best shot from that point forward. You know, you 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 can't you just can't you know, undervalue that. Now, I'm pretty sure they're going to have some practices at some point of the, like with just the healthy ones. Um, and they're going to continue testing until everybody comes off the list, which I want to get into that right now too, because something kind of, you know, shocked me 
was how they're going about this. So teams apparently are not testing regularly uh, this season. Now, I kind of knew about that, but to my understanding from the way it was stated, it seems like teams are not testing at all. Except when someone comes down with COVID, then they go back to doing COVID protocol shit like they did last year. Which to me is interesting because that means that teams could have players right now with COVID. But because no one is showing symptoms, because they have mild symptoms, that nobody's like runny nose or stuff like that, you don't have to test for it. And that means, you know, because look at it this way, there's 22 players right now in COVID protocol. You know, well, 23 now. You know, 10 of those is bulls. 10. But, There's also the other 13 players that are around the league. I know Charlotte had like three or four to include Terry Rozier and Lamella Wall. And actually, let me make that 24 because Paul Millsap went into safety protocols yesterday. You know, so, I mean, it's, it's in the league right now. I promise you. Hell, Miami, I think, had someone go into safety protocols just a couple days ago, too. You know, so it, it, it's it's definitely in the league, and it wouldn't surprise me if at all if like they end up having to shut down for like two weeks just to get everybody in the clear and then resume play again. It, it would not surprise me, but uh, you know, to the point, I did not realize that they weren't testing those guys pretty much at all. Which means, again, there are people on teams right now with like no symptoms who have COVID, and they're out there playing with other guys and giving them COVID. And it's, it's just an interesting dynamic. You would you would think that the league would have, you know, better, you know, situated or prepared themselves for that. But again, I don't think they're as informed as they try to say they are about COVID and the vaccination. Hell, I see people all the time, you know, talking about COVID on Twitter. And I can tell that they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. But I digress. This is not to be a political video about, you know, vaccine and all that other shit. That's not what my channel is for. So, I'm just saying for me personally, it wouldn't surprise me if more teams end up under COVID and then they have to, like, slow the league because, you know, this shit is happening. Or they have to not allow fans for a little while, you know, yada, yada, yada. But... I'll give them credit for them to start going have went as long as they did without having like a bunch of COVID cases. I want to give them credit for that. At least, you know, they, they've done pretty good. I know I seen a report that said like the NFL had like, I think it was like 28 people come down with COVID yesterday. Like for, for these leagues to be going on and doing what they're doing and they're just now getting COVID, you know, I got to give them props for that. Two months in basically, and you're just now starting to get infections and whatnot. Hey, you, you did a pretty damn good job. You did a pretty damn good job. Hell, even the fact that there's only 24, 25 people in the NBA right now with it, it's still a pretty damn good job when you consider uh, <clears throat> the 450 players on the teams. Now, there are staff members that have it. Hell, Stacey King and uh, Bill Whittington for sure had it for the Bulls. That's why you haven't seen Stacey King commentating or anything like that. Um, one of the Miami Heat personnel comments for the games, he got COVID. So it's still spreading to other people. It's still out there, and it's still something to be concerned about. But, I mean, you know, they, for the most part, they're doing a pretty good job of dealing with this. Um, <clears throat> or at least not getting it, you know, on a massive scale. But like I said, if they started doing multiple day testing like they got the Bulls doing, they're probably going to start popping hot on most teams, I believe. Having said that, I know a lot of people wanted to see Lonzo as the first option or the second option of, of a team. And I know I said I wouldn't worry about Lonzo against Detroit. He went in and beat Detroit uh, with Jaleel Okafor, Etuan Moore, Frank Jackson. Uh, he, beat, he beat them with those kind of guys. I wouldn't worry about him and Vooch in 
a couple others going in and beating Detroit. I, I feel like that was a winnable game. Toronto, on the other hand, nah. Absolutely not. But those games are getting postponed. Here's my theory, okay? I think they have two prime times to get that shit done. So there's a four-game gap between the 22nd and the 26th for the Bulls. I think they probably add a game maybe on the 24th or something or make it a back-to-back -back somewhere between, you know, those days. Not on Christmas. I don't think they have them play on Christmas. But they will definitely play at least one game during that week to make up for it. <clears throat> and I think they'll play another game sometime during that all-star all break, you know, recess. You know, so instead of having like that long week to just chill, you know, I think they'll, you know, play their all-star game and instead of having like three or four days after they're like, Ooh, I think they're going to get back in and say, all right, you guys are going to be playing, you know, second day before everybody else plays. So you, you'll have two days to prep and then you got a game. And then that's how they make that up. Which again, it still bodes well for them because they get to get this break right now and they get to kind of recoup. So think of it like a, a, another off season in a sense where they get to get their bodies ready and they can get to come out raring to go. Especially because Caruso has been so limited when he's been hurt. So this is good, this is good. Um, but yeah, I know a lot of people wanted to see Lonzo, you know, with the ball and stuff and everything, and, and that's cool, but eh, I don't care about Lonzo as the first or second option when he don't have shooters and weapons. You know, that that's my thing. You know, I, 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 I get people wanting to see him with the ball in his hands and dominate and all this other shit, but nah, man, get that man some shooters. Get that man some pure hoopers out there. And then, okay, let's see him with the ball in his hands. You know, don't sit there. Like, and I get it, you know. I, and I, I, I'm on the bandwagon to think that I, I personally think he can elevate, you know, those G League players to be, you know, formidable Ellie beat Detroit. So, I, I think he could do that to win games. You know, hell, he beat Golden State last year with just Zion. And if he can beat them with Zion, I mean, he can do pretty much anything else. You know, I, I can, I trust some. That's one thing I know for sure is I trust some. There's, there's a few guys in the league I feel that way about. You know, I know what I'm gonna get from so, for the most part on a night to night basis. I ain't worried about it. I am not worried about it. But anyways, I guess the, uh, the Rosen list experiment is over. And I know I've gotten a lot of flack and pushback from my DeRozan viewpoint. Look, man, I'm not saying, and I want to reiterate this, I'm not saying DeRozan is a bad player. You know, he is a phenomenal player, a great player. You know, he's probably, honestly, this year, he's probably top 10 in the league, if I'm going to be real. He's a top 10 player in the league. I just think, you know, you want to sell high instead of low. Because in two in two years when that contract is up, one, you don't want to bring him back on like 40, 50 million a year going into his mid 30s. Let's be real. That the organization is already going to be cashed out. You don't want to do that. I would rather, it's almost like, hey, his value is at the highest it will ever be. Let's flip him and get the requisite parts that would make this team be perfect and go from there. Now, where I truly believe DeRozan would be missed if he wasn't on this team is in the playoffs. I think he is so much better than DeRozan in the clutch. I mean, DeRozan. I think he's so much better than Zach in the clutch. I don't think Zach is there yet. I think he kind of needs that mentorship from, uh, from, from DeRozan. That's where I truly value DeRozan's presence, you know. I, I, that's where I would miss DeRozan the most. But, you know, it, it's, been, it's been an interesting last couple of days, you know, as we get into this conversation point. Because, you know, it was reported that the Celtics are going to probably look to separate, you know, Jalen and Jason Tatum. 
if, if that is going to happen, the door opens up for teams to come in and make some deals. Ben Simmons trade talks are heating up, and so there's going to be a possibility he's on the move. Hell, this morning I saw a three-team trade with Philly, uh, Portland, and the Lakers that got Russell Westbrook and C.J. McCollum to Philly, which honestly probably works for them if I'm going to be real. Got Ben Simmons and Tobias Harris into Portland, which honestly works for them. And got Dane to the Lakers, which works for them. And when I saw that, I was like, that's one of those kind of trades that everybody wins. Everybody wins. Now, of course, there will be other picks and things like that associated with it. And you might have to, you know, do a couple of minor players here and there to match salaries. But the main thing is that the players that they want, every team can get. So let's put that to the side. There's going to be more teams popping up with players that are to be traded. Tomorrow is the first day that everybody that was signed this offseason can be traded. It's the first day. So 85 85% or so of the league is about to come on sale. There's some, there's some teams out there that's going to be looking to make some plays. Like De'Aaron Fox has been, you know, chirping a little bit in, in Sacramento. Carl Anthony Towns has been chirping a little bit in Minnesota. I'm not saying that those teams are going to deal them. I'm not saying they're going to deal them. But keep your ear to the streets, people. Keep your ear to the streets. Also, mind the Pacers. They came out and said, hey, we're trying to rebuild. We need to get, we need to have a wholesale of all of our guys. You know, Otto Malcolm Brogdon said, hey, don't trade me. I want to stay here. Fuck that. Fuck that. Don't send me anywhere else. I'm good. Which is understandable. He actually left the Bucks to sign there. So that makes sense. But there's a lot of teams. Like there, there's teams right now that said, okay, look, we're, we're just not good enough. And we need to just tear the ship down and start over. And then there's going to be teams that are saying, look, we're not good enough. We need to move something or move apart to get the most out of this team. And so they're going to be teams that did like Chicago did last year said, okay, we're going to swing for the fences and make a play. Once we get that one guy, we will go and, and make our, our, our target list for the offseason. And that's where we'll set ourselves up for success. And so I expect this year's trade deadline and trade and trade season to be way better than last year's. Last year's was kind of subpar until the day of. But I actually expect there to be a bunch of moving pieces. And not just moving pieces, I also expect there to be a bunch of pieces that people probably sleep on in some of these trade deal acquisitions. You know, I expect there to be teams that get better just by virtue of subtracting players. And I also expect there to be teams that get better because they swing for the fences. And so, the Bulls should definitely be looking to get some players to augment or help this team. Now, I will say this. I know there's a lot of teams that are checking for Miles Turner. Miles Turner is the one guy who I've been consistent with on warning since back in the Pelicans days. I would really love Miles Turner on this team. I, I would really love Miles Turner on this team. If they could get him, you get him. By the way, people, Cam Reddish. Atlanta came out and said they only want a first in return for Cam Reddish. Look, I'm, I'm telling you right now, people, we got two Portlands. And we got ours. I call up, I call them up immediately. Hey, we'll give you a first. See, what I wanted to do initially is I wanted to give them Kobe White. But if you're telling me we can get him for a first, hey, give them the fucking first. Throw a couple seconds in there to make it wild. People might say, oh, you're paying for fuck that shit. Listen, you go get you a 6'8 wing. 
that can shoot and defend. You go get that. You definitely go get that. He will help off the bench. He fixes several issues on this team. You go get him. And it's only going to cost you a first. You're not going to get Cam Reddish or a better player than Cam Reddish at first. Not, not with your first because you're going to be in the back back end. But like, oh, they got I.O. They, trust me, they're not, they not going to get another I.O. Not in this trap. Go ahead, burn the first, go ahead and pick them up. Okay? That's what we're doing. You burn the first, you go get them. Now, you take the Kobe White that you could have traded, and now if you need to, like, sweeten the deal for another deal, you can throw Kobe White in it. Like, if you need to make a big swing, like you need to move off of Vucci, you need to throw in something extra, hey, we'll give you Kobe White. He's already expendable anyway. Io has shown that he's better as a player to me than Kobe is. And I know Kobe can get hot. I like Kobe. Don't get it wrong. But for what this team needs, look, if you're telling me, like, for instance, if you're saying, because I, I saw that they said Sacramento is willing to give up Bagley and Buddy Heald in a deal, I know a lot of people have strong feelings about Bagley. But if you're telling me, okay, we could go get rid of Fooch and get Buddy Heal off the bench and Marvin Bagley, great. And then we could make another deal to maybe swing for Miles Turner and we get Cam Reddish. We just solved our team. We just fucking solved our team, man. And you can hold on to Pat Will. Oh, we just solved our team. Or if you can find a way to parlay Pat Will for another big, another uh, power forward that we can use. We just solved the team, man. We got it. We fucking got the core. Once you got the core, it's just a matter of making it work. Now, I'm not saying any of those deals I just said would happen. But you, you best believe AK and Mark Eversley are on the phone trying to make something work. And I'm, let me say this to you guys, too. Watch whatever deals they make for this team because it is going to tell you how they feel. Watch the parts or the pieces they try to bring back because it will tell you how they feel about this team. If they're getting older, it means one of two things. They're viewing playoffs or deep run in the playoffs or they think that this team can break through and win the championship. If they're getting younger, or if they're getting better young pieces, like, I'm not saying they go get like a 19 or 20 year old, but they go get guys that are like 22, 23, to like maybe 26, 27. They're saying, we're, we're, we're looking for the long term. We're looking for guys who are gonna be, be with Zach Zoe Caruso for like the next decade. If that's the case, it means that they're looking for the long term. And that's what that's where your mind should, mindset, mindset should shift. That's exactly where your mindset should shift. And so this, this one is going to be interesting. Now, there's also the possibility that they just sit back and don't make any moves and just say, hey, we're going to play it cool. Understand that. I respect that. I get it, and if they do that, cool. You know, I'm not gonna sweat it or trip. But this, this, this trade deadline, this trade season, is gonna be something to watch. It's gonna be something to watch. And I, I gotta say this, man. I gotta say this. I know I still follow Will Guillory of The Athletic from the Pelicans. I also still follow Christian Clark because I like them. They're about the only two media guys from the Pelicans that I actually um, liked. To me, it's funny. Normally, if you have a good GM, or you have a good front office, they address the issues of the team so that they aren't issues 
the following year or they aren't as big issues. So let's just say, for instance, if your issue is the backcourt, even if you can't make your backcourt elite, you still make your backcourt like better. Okay, like if you go from having a thir the 30th ranked backcourt to like the 20th rank, you did your job. And even if you can't make it like say, you know, top 10, if you go like, if you're incrementally increasing, you've done your job. Can anyone tell me what they've done for their backcourt? <clears throat> Because we were told all last year that Lonzo and Eric Bledsoe are the problem. Now, I agree Eric Bledsoe was part of the problem. I for sure agree on that. Lonzo, however, not so much. Not so much for Lonzo. And... To me, and I saw I saw a tweet <clears throat> with a couple other guys that I respect, and they were talking about how the Pelicans should have been title contenders this year, and I assume they mean this is like healthy Zion and whatnot. And when I sit here and I think about this, um. And this was considering what they had available to them. I don't agree. However, I think they should have been right there in terms of they could have been a sleeper team that nobody wanted to play. But yeah, man, they, they had a lot of options. They had a lot of options. Tyler Hero, Cam, DeAndre Hunter, uh, Rui, even. Um, all those good players that came out of that draft. They could have still had Jackson Hayes later. Um, you know, they could have had all those guys next to Zion, Zoe, and B.I. and Josh Hart. And they would have been ready to go this year. Would have been ready to go. And they fumbled that. They fucked that up. And they've regressed because now they're making articles about how bad their backcourt is. And we tried to tell the people, we, we tried to let them know, hey, this is what's going to happen to you. And we were told Graham was, you know, Dame Lillard. We were told Kara and now were the future. And they just been getting their ass bust. Although Kara, you know, went out with a season ending ACL, MCL injury. So hope he recovers, have a speedy recovery. Um, no pun intended. Uh and everything. You don't want to see a player get hurt like that. But uh you got you gotta hope that he recovers and can resume his career successfully after that. But we tried telling them, man. We sure did. And this is where they at. And I know B.I. B.I.'s enjoy getting his shots, but B.I. ain't loving this losing shit. I can promise you that. Seeing Lonzo go to a different team and he's contributing and winning, I know he don't like that shit because Lonzo should have still been a Pelican. And the Pelican should have been way better than what they were. But anyway, that's all I got for you guys. Um, can't wait to hear your thoughts. Hope y'all have a good day. Peace.